from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips. Our guest for this edition of Conservative Roundtable is Dr. Larry Wurzel. And his resume is so extraordinary that rather than uh, refer to my memory, I'm going to read you excerpts from it. Dr. Wurzel is Vice President and Director of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage Foundation, which includes both the Asian Studies Center and the Center for International Trade and Economics. Uh, he joined Heritage as Asian Studies Center Director in 1999 upon completing a distinguished 32-year career in the U.S. Armed Forces. Dr. Wurzel's last military position was as director of the Strategic Studies Institute of the United States Army War College. Following three years in the Marine Corps, where he served in Morocco and Camp Pendleton, California, and a stint in college, Dr. Wurzel enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1970. So he went Marines first and then Army. And his first assignment with the Army Security Agency took him to Thailand, where he focused on Chinese military communications in Vietnam and Laos. Within three years, he had graduated as an, uh, from Infantry Officer Candidate School, as well as both Airborne and Ranger Schools. He's a member of the OCS Hall of Fame. Uh, I could go on. Uh, his uh, training, his knowledge is very extensive. I'll just mention briefly that he was an assistant army attache at the U.S. Embassy in Communist China, where he witnessed and reported the Tiananmen Square massacre and uh, many, many other things. He's been a fac faculty member at the U.S. Army War College. Uh, he retired from the Army as a colonel. He's the editor of an excellent publication produced by Heritage called China's Growing Military Power, Perspectives on Security, ballistic missiles, and conventional capabilities. Dr. Wurzel, as we make this broadcast, we see in the newspapers uh, rising discontent in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was a colony of the United Kingdom, and uh, the uh, British government of Margaret Thatcher turned it back yeah. to the People's Republic of China, or actually... That's shorthand for the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. That's really <laughs> that, that, those. I guess it's nine people you're, right now yeah, who run things. Yeah, that's really know? what, that's what right. you get when you talk about China. Now you were there in Tiananmen Square, and there are some interesting books published about what happened leading up to it and followed mm -hmm. from it, and decisions in the inner circles and so forth. Um, talk about what's happening in Hong Kong today, where. Uh, there is uh, uh, anger at the new security laws being imposed on the former colony, and where uh, during the month of July, some 20,000 people yeah. demonstrated publicly uh, against the regime, against the law. This must be very nerve-wracking for the communists in Beijing. It, it has to drive the communists in Beijing crazy. It, it, the interesting thing about Hong Kong it, it has <coughs> never enjoyed democracy, but it has tremendous rule of law as a, a leftover British institution, uh, and, and it always enjoyed a free press. Freedom of expression was, was always <coughs> there, and it's the freest economy in the world. The, the Index of Economic Freedom uh, that we publish at the Heritage Foundation with the Wall Street Journal uh, for, for Three, four years. Incredibly running. low taxes. Low taxes, uh, I, I, but but as the Chinese Communist Party began to increase its control over parts of Hong Kong, uh, I, I think it's fair to say it's put cells around there. It, 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 there's a, a slight difference, uh, certainly, in the freedom of the press, and uh, people are beginning to react to it. They're beginning to react. Uh, and, and seek a, a voice in decisions around them uh, by the appointed, when the appointed leader from Beijing uh, puts into practice laws that would really restrict the opportunity of the people in Hong Kong to express dissatisfaction. When the Soviet Union faced uprisings in its satellites in Prague, 
what is now the Czech Republic, uh, in East Germany, uh, in Hungary, and elsewhere. Uh, they firmly used military force yep. to quell discontent. Uh, the Communist Chinese uh, are reluctant to do that because their economy is burgeoning thanks to Western trade policies and their ability to attract uh, foreign industry, their ability to market their goods overseas, uh, their ability to be seen as, as non-threatening right. and as respectable uh, would be uh, set back tremendously if they repeated the kind of crackdown which you personally witnessed in Tiananmen Square. Yeah, but, yeah. but they may have no alternative. Uh, they may have no alternative. I think they'll work very hard to avoid it. Uh, if, if, if the, the build-up the, sort of to Tiananmen Square was very instructive this way. Um, the, the all of, of 1988, uh, the early part of 1989 in Beijing, uh, and around China, but particularly in Beijing, uh, it was really wide open. Uh, I mean, very senior people out of the Communist Party apparatus were at rock concerts around the country, <laughs> and uh, loads of private enterprises opened up, uh, street stalls, restaurants. Uh, folks were gathering in political meetings, and nothing much was done about it. And and then as a, and and frankly, there was a, a real battle inside the Communist Party over how far to let it go. So nobody did anything. It was par almost paralysis. But but then the the Party Politburo got together, and and they sort of put out what should have been uh, to anybody brought up in that system a fairly clear ultimatum that says, "All right, we got your message. It's kind of gone far enough. Now." Let's stop. And it was done in a very subtle way. It was um, it was Children's Day, if I remember right, and and the, and the most senior widow of of a very senior party official got on television and the radio and said, "As a grandmother, I want to be able to take my grandchildren to Tiananmen Square without a demonstration." Very subtle, you know. And the students and the workers ignored her completely. And two days later, the, the People's Liberation Army murdered some 2,500 to 3,700 people. We don't know how many. So I, I think that is something that the PLA wants to avoid and the w Communist were Party. Were they to do it in Hong Kong, the level of consternation and outrage worldwide, in my opinion, would far exceed... Absolutely. The reaction at Tiananmen Square. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I think that the level of, uh, which is what really uh, affects the Communist Party, the level of foreign investment and, and confidence in the manufacturing and banking system would drop significantly. And while we're on the subject of Hong Kong, uh, the PRC is trying to build up Shanghai and to yes. make it a great world center of business. I spent some time in Shanghai, yeah. and I saw a lot of empty buildings, which... Uh, well, Hong Kong's yeah. not having a great time yeah. right now, either. But, I think Hong Kong's at about 50 to 60 percent occupancy. Shanghai is probably about 30, 35 percent occupancy. Uh, to what degree is the emphasis on Shanghai uh, transcending or hurting the economy of Hong Kong? There yeah. seems to be a pattern that PRC political leaders, to some degree, come out of Shanghai. Zhang Zemin and yeah. others yeah, come whole, out of Shanghai. And um, uh, to what degree is there a competition between Shanghai and Hong Kong, and in your view, which, if either, will prevail? As long as Hong Kong has uh, rule of law, a low level of corruption, uh, a low level of government intervention I in business, it, it's always going to win. It, it's got honest, straight, accountable financial services and corporate management, and, and you, can, you can actually conduct due diligence inspections of what you're doing. Uh, in, in, in Shanghai, it, it's still communist China. I mean, 
the, the, the veneer of, of a, a good modern city with a well-functioning port and infrastructure is there, but a lot of corruption. Uh, the, doing corporate due diligence in Shanghai means who's the most senior communist official you can bribe. Quick story. Uh, while we were there, my group, uh, under the sponsorship of the Conservative Caucus Foundation, visited many things. We visited the World Bank. We visited the, uh, I guess it was the General Motors plant yeah. uh, in Shanghai, and we, uh, we looked at the uh, annual report. And one of the people in our group said, this is a very interesting report, but there are no numbers in it. Right. There's just a picture of the head of the plant with Zhang Zemin. And uh, that's, there you are. That's, that's you it. <laughs> what is the word? Uh, Guangxi? Guangxi. 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 Guangxi is relationship. relationships. And, and uh, relationships. Yeah. Far more important than numbers. That's right. When we come back after this break, I'm going to ask Dr. Wurzel to give us his view on U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Korea and also uh, a perspective on what's happening uh, in the uh, desire of communist China to incorporate the Republic of China on Taiwan under its rule. Please stay with us. One of the top leaders in the communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible. And uh, as a result of the extra money they have, they're not only taking jobs from the United States, they're increasing their military budget by 17% a year. It's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org, or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. Our guest for this broadcast is Dr. Larry Wurzel, Vice President of the Heritage Foundation with an extensive and extraordinary background at home and abroad, uh, in the military and out of it, uh, with uh, uh, knowledge of events happening throughout the world. We're, in this broadcast, we're focusing on Asia, and there's been much talk lately about uh, what to do with North Korea, uh, mm -hmm. where there's a president who uh, loves Elizabeth Taylor but hates America, watches American movies and uh, so forth and so on, but uh, many people think he's a little bit nuts. Uh, he certainly, of course, under game theory, if you act a little bit nuts, people don't know what to do with you. Um, and the question is, what do we do about North Korea? Do we do it alone, unilaterally? Do we bring in the PRC? Do we bring in Japan? What is the nature of the threat? How big a threat is it? And how ought we react? Well, it's a huge conventional threat, Howard. I mean, it, it, there's over a million people in uniform. There's 12,000 artillery pieces that on a moment's notice are able to to attack about 20 million South Koreans and a good half of the 37,000 U.S. troops that are in South Korea. I was glad that Rumsfeld indicated a desire to move them away from the demarcation Well, line. I think it's a smart thing to yeah. do. I, I think it's a smart thing to do because we <coughs> evolved in the American military how we fight. Our deployment on the demilitarized zone, and, and I served on the DMZ in the 2nd Infantry Division, 76-77, hasn't changed fundamentally since the end of the Korean War. But the way we fight, our ability to, I mean, we mass fire precision weapons and missiles instead of massing troops today. Look what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so the, the way 
Americans fight is different enough to warrant a change in deployment. But I think it's also time to let the, the South Korean military take responsibility for a lot of their own defense. And, and the most important thing would be lodgement areas if you had to flow more forces in. Now, now there is uh, there's a huge missile threat from North Korea. Uh, they may have nuclear weapons. Uh, the guy probably is a little crazy, Kim Jong-il. But if you looked in today's, I guess the Washington Times had it, USA Today had it, I, I was up in Boston, the Boston Globe had it, right under the article that had the headline about the new nuclear program was another one about the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Prisoners of War and Missing in Action meeting with a North Korean Colonel General, essentially a three-star general, in Bangkok and agreeing to pay, I think it was $2.1 million dollars so that the United States could send over a major prisoner of war missing in action search team that will be traveling all around north of Pyongyang and over in the chosen reservoir area to look for Korean war missing in action. <laughs> the North Koreans are not crazy. You know, they're, they're, clearly they're, they're they, they want a deal. Well, I don't think, I, I, they want a deal. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think ideally they want their cake and, and, yeah. and the money too. They would like, I think, to be a nuclear power. Yeah. Uh, and they'd like help with their economy. And they'd like diplomatic recognition. And, and that's why I think the administration has played it just about right. At what point does North Korea become a threat to the territory and population of the United States of America. How many years away are they from that? I don't think they're far away from it right now. I think that's what Bill Perry was referring to today in his course in the Washington Secretary. Post. Right. That's right. Uh, I think that's what Rumsfeld and the Rumsfeld Commission report hit on. Uh, I, I think they could be a threat to the United States quickly within a year or two. I think that only illustrates I mean, when you're in these sort of security dilemmas, it's a kind of a prisoner's dilemma. You know, Japan's a player, South right. Korea's a player, and, and China's and, a player. And China's you got to change the game. Yeah. And the, the first thing that changes the game with North Korea is effective ballistic missile defenses for the United States. How far are we away uh, from uh, that? Probably a year or two from getting something that would really work there. But... But I think we really need to do that. You know, Americans need to be protected, mm -hmm. and, and you don't need a major deployment of ballistic missile defenses, and that changes the dynamic. Well, I, I can't disagree with you. In the beginning of the late 70s and 1980, uh, the Conservative Caucus tried to recruit other organizations in the conservative movement, and we succeeded. Uh, Dan Graham started High Frontier. Heritage Foundation was involved, released a major study. Phyllis Schlafly was involved. John Fisher's American Security Council was involved. We did a nationwide tour. I had a team of 15 retired uh, general officers who traveled with us around the country talking about the need for a global ballistic missile defense. And then in March of 1983, uh, Ronald Reagan articulated right. his support for it. And uh, apparently that had a, an impact on the way the folks in the Kremlin uh, viewed their strategic options. And uh, I'm glad to see that the Rumsfeld Commission in the late yes. 1990s played so important a part in re-upping uh, the issue, in uh, legitimating it, in building an incredible consensus among the diverse members yes. of the, he, he really of the did Rumsfeld. Job. The Rumsfeld yeah. did a phenomenal job. And I was very glad that uh, President Bush uh, kept his word and got us out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Uh, I'm a good friend of Hank Cooper, who was head of, yes. of yeah. uh, the SDI office under the first President Bush, and I know at first he was somewhat skeptical about what would happen, but I know that as time went on, he became increasingly encouraged that at last the United States might take the steps needed uh, to defend itself against this kind of an attack. And in the wake of uh, 911, uh, I think opposition to SDI is disappeared, although it's, uh, the problem it deals with is different. Uh, yeah, but it, it, I think that people, uh, you, you'll hear these excuses that yeah. say, well, you still have yeah. 
ports to where it, yeah you do but i think yeah. everybody yeah. realizes people now know we we're need missile defense we're vulnerable, we're vulnerable. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is that uh, last year, I don't know if you, you know that in, in, I think it was June of 2002, the Russians and the Chinese introduced a new draft United Nations Treaty in Geneva that would prohibit even conventional weapons in space. So that, that the whole Reagan idea of brilliant pebbles, right. a, really a global missile defense system that's space-based, uh, they realize would be effective. That, the they the know it would be effective. And of course, even as they do that, the PRC is moving toward development of its oh. uh, space program. They've got a space program. They have an anti-satellite uh, program. They have their own anti-ballistic missile program. Uh, they've moved now about 350 to 400 short-range ballistic missiles opposite Taiwan. Uh, I think they will begin to also deploy road mobile intermediate range missiles that can target Taiwan or Japan. Uh, th they have a formidable military, although uh, I I unevenly developed. One last thing on Korea. To what degree do you think Beijing is worried about an influx of immigrants from Korea into China? I think that's a red herring issue. The People's Liberation Army is quite capable of lining itself up and, and if, if ordered, machine gunning any Korean that crosses the so river. So it's not a big deal. I, I, I think it could be a big deal, but it's not their major concern. Right. To what their major concern, I think, is a, a destabilization of all of Northeast Asia that could really create business risk and prevent investment uh, and manufacturing in Northeast China. To what degree does Beijing have influence over decisions made in Pyongyang? Seventy to eighty-eight percent of North Korea's fuel needs and thirty to forty percent of North Korea's food needs are supplied by China. That gives them leverage. And I would assume there's no real possibility of Kim Jong-il being ousted internally. Uh, I, I, I don't know anyone that could give you a credible estimate of that. I, I, I mean, there's anyone that tells you they know how he thinks or they know what his next move will be uh, or, or, or that thinks that they have really good insight into the internal machinations of the North Korean government uh, is probably making it up. I, I don't know many people that have that kind of insight. Larry, we have to take another break. When we come back in the uh, two or three minutes remaining, I'm going to ask Dr. Wurzel to give his predictions about how the uh, relations between mainland China and Taiwan uh, will play out in the period ahead and uh, to what degree uh, U.S. policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan will impact uh, the unfolding of events. Please stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and promote the sanctity of life. Thank you. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruca and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. When you see the terrible decline in public morality, do you have a suspicion that something's gone wrong in America? Would you like to make a positive difference for freedom and for liberty? Institute on the Constitution is a historical study designed to teach you about the basic core ideas behind the Constitution. The ideas that built America. Call the number on the screen and learn more. The Institute on the Constitution, 410-768-2280, www.instituteontheconstitution.com. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. 
which sponsors this program. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. If you're interested in learning more about the kinds of papers that Dr. Wurzel publishes and the work in general of the Heritage Foundation, of which he is the vice president, uh, you can check out their website, which is on the screen. Uh, Dr. Wurzel, um, we've, the, the, the Taiwan mainland China yeah. issue has been with us ever since Chiang Kai-shek left the mainland in the late 1940s. 1947, and yeah. it's been an issue in many presidential campaigns. It was a key issue in the Nixon-Kennedy race at the very end in 1960. I remember the debates on that. How is this going to play out? Uh, when I was in uh, communist China a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to talk to and debate with uh, officials of the uh, PRC government, including the head of their Foreign Affairs Committee, and they're not kidding about this. They really feel very, this is an article of faith, this is part of their religion. How can this thing, can it play out in such a way that the people on Taiwan preserve their liberty and independence? I, first of all, I think it can, Howard, uh, and I think the position that President Bush took, and it was a nuanced position, he doesn't get the credit for the nuances when he said, we'll do everything it takes to help Taiwan defend itself, uh, was the right position to take. Uh, but, but in the end, uh, I, I don't think either side there really wants a war. And, and, and I, I think you have to remember that the, the Communist Party of China is very serious about this, but they can reverse themselves like any Communist Party and change reality tomorrow. They have done that to their own senior leaders. If they chose to redefine success as a, a Taiwan that is a, has a Chinese essence. And by the way, this is why Hong Kong is so important. That's right. And what they do there is so significant because they have said to Taiwan, uh, you can have the same kind of independence and, that Hong Kong has. And it's not working they in Hong Kong. Dr. Wurzel, our time is up. Thank you well, so thank much. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for joining us on Conservative Roundtable.